Hello, and I welcome you to the online streaming for Olive Branch Baptist Church. Our opening scripture today is found in Psalm chapter 90, verse 14. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love, that we may rejoice and be glad in all our days. Now comes a time where we look at our prayer concerns and announcements. On September 29th, we hit the fifth Sunday of the month, which means we will be having a soup and sandwich meal after church. So mark your calendars. Bible study continues Wednesdays at 630. At the first of the month, we've been having the high school youth night. But because of last week's holiday, we are having the youth night tonight, September 8th. At five o'clock, this is for high school students, but just in general, go ahead and mark your calendars. This is open to the community. The first Sunday of the month, we'll be having a community-wide high school youth night. So we're excited for that. We also ask that you help us by praying for that. Uh, we just wanna have a huge community impact and also create an atmosphere where high school students can come, they can feel welcome, they can get some food, but we can also learn about how to work Jesus into our everyday life in preparation for when they fly the coop and they leave Olive Branch and they go to college or start in the workforce. We just want them to have that firm foundation in Christ. So we're excited. We ask for your prayers as we move through this journey. We um, continue to pray for the YMCA and the things going on there. We do just want you to mark your calendars that on October 26th, there is a 5K to try to raise some money for that. So add that to your calendars. We did launch a new children's programming this week, and so we want to continue to pray for that, for the teachers, for the leaders, just that the youth and our youngest church family members will just experience Jesus in a new way because of this programming. So we ask that you pray with us in this transitional time. As we look at our prayer concerns from today, we wanted to add Heidi Kerner. She has a bone growth on her right knee that's been causing a lot of pain, so we want to continue to pray for her. Also, we've been praying for Aaron and Nick Eves as they lost their six-week-old grandson who passed away this week. So we want to pray for that whole situation. Also, we've been praying for Melinda Hunt's mom, Ramona. Ramona is in the hospital with double lung pneumonia. She also has sepsis. They've been kind of putting her on diuretics, and she's been having a lot of health issues. Um, she has a pacemaker and two artificial heart valves, um, but they also have concerns about infection around those. And so it's a, um, it's a significant situation, and we want to be intentionally in prayer for Ramona today. Also, we did get an update from Judy on Christine, her daughter. Um, she has a concussion. She is home. She was in a car accident this week. That was quite significant. We do want to praise God that Christine, although has had some injuries, is doing well for how significant the accident was. So we pray for that. Also, Judy and Morris have been going through a lot of health issues. And Judy, as she's been diagnosed with lung cancer and has some things coming up, and Morris, as he continues to have heart issues, we just want to be in prayer for them. We've been praying for Andy Dole. He was at church today, had shoulder surgery to last week. It went well, but we continue to pray for his healing. We've been praying for Regan Kitchell as she has lymphoma acute B cell and she has been having chemo for that. Also, we continue to pray for baby EJ. This is Hillary and Bobby's daughter. She's been in the NICU now for a few weeks, but is doing so very well. EJ is up to three pounds, 12 ounces, and was able to transition to a crib. And just great things are happening already in baby EJ's life. So we continue to pray that God's hand be upon her and be upon Hillary and Bobby as they, they travel back and forth. Also, we've been praying for Stephanie Deacons as she had the tumor removed. She is doing quite well. She is home, but we continue to pray for her healing. Also, we pray for Mark Lee as he is home and still healing. Also, Gary Taylor, as he was diagnosed with lung cancer, um, his wife, Mary Ann, has Parkinson's disease. And Gary this week had a really hard week. And so they have a lot of um, challenging dynamics going on. So we want to be in prayer for Gary and his wife, Mary Ann. We've been praying for Nolan Lang as he's a young boy that got medical rods in his spine. He was in a cast. I haven't had an update on him in a while, but we still want to continue to pray for his healing. Also, Angie Haskell and her health issues. We also pray for Owen Schneider as he's the young boy. Um, this is Aaron's grandson, Aaron Eves, as he has been having some issues with his leukemia and the potential of remission for that or reoccurrence for that, excuse me. And so we continue to pray for him. Also, we continue to pray for Pete Swango as he gets tests for his heart and the things that are going on there. We've been praying for Renzi as he's been having some muscle and joint pain, so we want to continue to pray for him. Also, we added 
Um, a family member of Amanda's baby Brewer was born to Hunter and Jordan, but Brewer they think has a heart murmur, so they're still in the hospital, so we pray that that resolves. Uh, also, we wanted to add John Erickson. He had three stints, also needs more stints, but they don't wanna do that until his kind of heart and body gets stronger. The last we heard he was in ICU, so we wanna to continue to pray for John Erickson. Also, we pray for um, someone that Debbie Price knows who has decided to step off of dialysis um, and has entered hospice. We just pr pray that God gives that individual peace even though we don't know his name. Also, there's been a lot of just negative things happening in the media from just shootings and war. And we just pray for the climate of where we are right now for our world. We just ask that God would intervene into whatever way he sees fit but also he can provide us peace in this time. Um, lastly, we always pray for Pat as he leads our church family. So won't you pray with me today? God, we are thankful and humbled and honored that we get to come before you with prayer concerns on this list, knowing that you know them and you know each situation. We just ask that you be with us as we move through this life, that we could be stewards of what you give us, Lord, that we could be disciples, that we could speak your truths. Lord, we pray for those who have lost loved ones this week. We pray for those who are battling health issues. We pray for those family members of the ones who are battling health issues. We continue to ask that you would provide the peace and the joy in turbulent times that we know that only you can give us. Lord, we just ask that you place a boldness in our heart, that as we go throughout this week, that we could be just a vessel of light in such a dark, dark world. We are humbled that you choose us to be children of God, that you call us to speak your truths. And we just pray that through us, people would see you. We love you and we praise you. And we thank you for Olive Branch, not as a building, but as a people who can go out and do your work. We are humbled by the way you love us. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Um, we are in our third week uh, this today uh, of a series that I've been calling Come to Your Senses. Um, Two weeks ago, we started with the sense of sight and, and how we see other things and how we see other people around us. Um, are we skeptical when we see certain groups of people, uh, people in certain situations? Are we skeptical of them or do we see opportunities to serve and minister to them? Um, as as um, we think about what we see from our inside looking out. And also, we need to be more aware of what other people see who are on the outside when they look in toward us and our thoughts and our actions. Then last week, we talked about hearing. Um, uh, how much information that we receive and process today comes from a very noisy world around us. Lots of lots of loudness, lots of confusion, lots of chatter. But in all of that, are we continuing to adjust our hearing, physical and spiritual hearing, uh, to filter out that noise around us until we hear what Scripture calls that still, small voice of God. Now, with that, today I want to move to another sense that... that we, uh, we can you, be used by God in a sense that can be used for God in terms of our relationship with Him and also our relationship with other people. So uh, today we're going to talk about the sense of touch. Um, uh, at this point I was going to say reach out and touch somebody, but that really, in 2024, that really doesn't work real well. Um, but... Um, for many of us, the sense of touch is a very personal thing. Um, we have our zones around us, right? Our personal zones that um, sometimes uh, certain personalities, we don't like people entering that, that personal space. We like to kind of keep people at a distance, right? Now, now, I have to admit I'm a hugger, but I also have to admit at one point in my life, I was not a hugger in any way, shape, or form. I didn't used to be. My family that I grew up with was not exactly warm and fuzzy kind of people. Um, but then I started dating Jaquita and attending her family functions, and I quickly learned that, that her family was an entire tribe of huggers. Um, you, uh, they didn't even have to know who you were to hug you. 
And um, so reluctantly, I sort of became a hugger too. Um, but um, there, there are all sorts of times that, that I feel the need to, to give someone a hug. But I'm also very careful to make sure that, that my hugging them doesn't make them uncomfortable as I enter their personal space, right? And maybe you're a hugger too. Um, or maybe right now you're desperately hoping that I don't ask all of you to reach over and hug your neighbor. Um, and, and I'm not going to do that. Uh, but, but, you know, when we think about touch, there are, there are several moments in Scripture, right, where Jesus touches people. He lays his hands on people to heal them. Most of the time, like I said, it is a way of healing them, but, but there, there are other opportunities that Jesus takes to, to physically put his hands on someone or wrap his arms around someone. We'll get back to, to that in a few minutes, but, but for our opening scripture today, I want to read a very familiar story to you. Um, you may not know where it is in the Bible but I'm guessing that every one of you has heard at least some version of it. It's found in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10, verses 25 to 37. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn there. If not, it's going to be up on the screens. Uh, the 10th chapter of Luke, beginning in verse 25. And it's a parable that Jesus tells about a good Samaritan. Luke records, On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? Jesus replied, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied, do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, where he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, he passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came to where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him, and he bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to an innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense that you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The expert of the law replied, the one who has had mercy on him. And Jesus told him, go and do likewise. So ends the reading of God's word. Join me in prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, again, I just thank you for this day. I thank you for the opportunity to share your word. And, and I just ask, Father, that, that not only our minds would be open to what you are saying, but also our hearts. Father, we, we love you. We ask that all things we do here glorify you. And we ask these things in your son's name. Amen. Uh, Courtney mentioned it earlier, so almost all of you know, but Jaqueen and I have a new granddaughter, Eden Joy, who was born on August the 9th, the day before chicken fry. Good timing, Eden. Um, so she was a month old. She was four weeks old this past Friday. My wife and I are having a, a, a disagreement. I said she was a month old on Friday, and she said, no, she won't be a month old until tomorrow. But I'm like, Friday was four weeks. But anyway, she's a month old. Um, but, uh, but Eden wasn't supposed to be here until October the 28th. She was supposed to be a Halloween baby. Um, and so she's currently taking up residence in the NICU unit at Good Samaritan Hospital in Cincinnati. And as Courtney said, she's uh, kind of knocking it out of the park. But um, one of the things that is relatively new, at least to me, is the concept of skin-to-skin -skin contact between a mom and a newborn. And also between a dad and a newborn. Thankfully, there's not skin-to-skin -skin contact requirements for a grandpa and a newborn. Um, 
But as soon as the baby is born, apparently, it is placed skin to skin on its mama's chest. And then when dad later holds the newborn, he takes his shirt off so that the skin to skin touch time can be experienced. There's something healing and and bonding about not only holding a new baby, but, but literally its skin touching your skin. The, the concept of touch is very vital in the early development of a baby. It's also vital to a child as he or she grows. There have been tests over the years about children who were in, put in orphanages at early ages and, the, and that they grew up and they physically grew, but they had all kinds of emotional problems because nobody ever touched them. Nobody ever held them. So the concept of touch is absolutely vital to a young person, to a child's physical, emotional, and cognitive development. And I don't think it's a coincidence that when it came to encounters between Jesus and others, like I said earlier, that even though Jesus didn't need to touch them, there are all kinds of places in Scripture where Jesus heals people he's not even in the same room with. So even though he didn't need to touch them in order to heal them, Jesus chose to place his hands on them. So let's look at a little Old Testament history just for some context, okay? Um, in the book of Leviticus, uh, it is filled with all sorts of rules and regulations um, about what God's people, the Hebrew nation at the time, what they could and what they could not do, okay? And also what they could and could not touch. Now, it's, it's, all full of, um, it's all full of references to you can't touch anything dead, you can't touch a corpse, you can't do those things. But the Mosaic Covenant specifically does not forbid Jews from touching non-Jewish people if they're alive. But after the Ten Commandments, as we've talked about in the past, the Pharisees and the other Jewish leaders, they added 613 laws on top of the ten God gave them, because evidently they thought God didn't do enough. They added 613 more laws that the Jewish people were supposed to follow, including a belief that it, would be, it was impure, it would make you unclean if you were a Jewish person and you even touched a non-Jewish person. You weren't supposed to have anything to do with them, but you really weren't even supposed to touch them. That's why Peter, in preaching in, in Acts chapter 10, verse 28, when Jesus is preaching to a crowd... Uh, Acts 10 28 says he Peter he said to them you are well aware that it is it is against our law for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile but God has shown that I should not call anyone impure or unclean unclean so these people are living in this world where there's a certain segment of people that I can't even touch I'm not supposed to be around them and, and they are isolated in all of this, right? So if, if you weren't of pure Jewish heritage, you shunned those who were not of pure Jewish heritage. And they did so in part because they were afraid if they touched them or helped them, they would be made unclean and they could be removed from the synagogue, right? So this is the world that everybody's living in. So now let's go back to the parable. Now, it's really important, at least to me, that we see this passage, and it begins with not Jesus telling this story, but this expert in the law asking Jesus, not about whether or not I can touch people, or who I can touch and who I can't. But he says, how can I inherit eternal life? 
So he's trying to trick Jesus. He's trying to uh, get Jesus to, to say something that he can later use to discredit him. So this all starts with this Jewish leader, this um, keeper of the law. And he says, what can I do to inherit eternal life? And then Jesus answers, what does the law say? In other words, what does your law say? You tell me. You're an expert in the law. You're an expert in, in Jewish law and in Jewish covenant. You tell me what you have to do to inherit eternal life. What's the law say? And the expert replies, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. And basically Jesus says, that's right. So go and do that. You got it. I don't have to answer your question. You answered it for yourself. All you got to do is go do that. But the Jewish scholar then has a question. Exactly who is my neighbor? And that, and it's that question where Jesus begins to tell this parable. Jesus says that there's this, there's this man and he's walking from Jerusalem to Jericho. And it's a passage that goes down through the mountains and it's about 24 miles 40 kilometers, and we've talked a lot about 40 is a big number in the Bible. It's 40 kilometers, which uh, is interesting to me. Anyway, <clears throat> it's about 24 miles to walk down there. <clears throat> Jerusalem's high, Jericho's down low, he's walking down through this mountain pass. <clears throat> Excuse me. And because you're going through the mountains, there's all these twists and turns and different places, and, and it was a road, a pathway that that a lot of thieves and robbers, there were places they could hide. And when they found people who were walking and they were isolated from other people, they could jump out and, and attack them. They could rob them. And then once they robbed them, they could either kill them or they could leave them for dead. So it was a very dangerous stretch of road. And you, you, you really, if you were going to walk it, you walked it during the daylight and you also walked it in a group of people. So that's what happens to our guy here. Jesus says that the man, he's walking down this road and it says he was robbed, he was stripped of all of his clothing and he was left on the side of the road beaten half to death. And then the story shifts to a collection of other travelers on the same path. The first guy Jesus tells a story about is a priest, church guy. And being a man of God, you might think that he would run to the man to see to his care, but he doesn't do that. Instead, being a good Jew, the priest crosses over to the other side of the road and keeps on walking. He doesn't stop to help him, and he sure doesn't touch him. The next person in the story is a Levite. Leviticus, Levite, get it? Levites are descendants of the, tr the tribe of Levi, one of the 12 original tribes. And they were given specific responsibilities by God to care for the temple and to oversee what went on in the temple and to perform the rituals of the temple. And because they were given that specific responsibility and God gave them that role, the tribe of Levi did not get any land to possess once they entered the promised land. All these other tribes got hunks of land. Levi, the Levites didn't because they were going to be working in all of these temples and doing all of God's work. So they didn't need any land. But because they didn't have any land, they also had no way to support themselves. So once they get into the promised land, all of the other tribes are ordered to care for the people of the tribe of Levi. They're going to do my work and you're going to support them so they don't have to go out and do other things other than what I need them to do. So 
from the time they came into the promised land, the survival and the welfare of the tribe of Levi, the Levites, was directly tied to others doing what they were told to do by God. But they survived by other people showing them compassion and showing them charity. See, I can't raise food, so I have to rely on you to do what you were supposed to, to give me food, so I can keep doing God's work. So, you might think that with this background, the Levite, the Levite might act in a charitable way to a stricken man. He understands the charity aspect because that's how he survives. Here's a man who is in need of help, a man who is in need of care. But the parable says, he too crossed over to the other side of the road and walked on. Now I want to pause here for just a minute to, to point something out that many people assume about this parable. And that's the nationality of the man who was robbed and beaten. See, there are a lot of people out there who hear about the parable of the Good Samaritan, and they believe that the beaten man was the Samaritan. He was a person from Samaria who had been an outcast by the Jewish society because they were not pure. These people married outside of their faith or they married outside of their nationality. And because of that, they could no longer live in the, the Jewish communities with Jewish people. So all of these people from all over the known world, they all ended up sort of gathering in this same geographic area that they called Samaria. And, and all of these people, they'd been kind of thrown out of every place else. So they gathered together. And so they lived together, basically shunned by everything around them. And they called their country Samaria, and they were Samaritans living in Samaria. Now, there are some people who read this parable, and they think that the first two men didn't stop because they see that the beaten man was from Samaria, therefore it would have been unclean for them to help him or touch him. But that's not true. The Samaritan isn't the victim. The Samaritan is the third guy coming down the road. Now watch. Jesus makes a point in the parable to say that the man who was robbed had been stripped of all of his clothes. They not only took all of his money, they took all of his clothes. They left him naked laying on the side of the road. So visually, the first two men had no way of telling what nationality the man was. Back then, people from different countries dressed in different ways, and you could see by what they were wearing, who they were, where they were from. But this guy, you have no way. He's beaten and bloodied and he's laying naked in the side of the road and you don't know if he's Jewish, Samaritan, Ethiopian, any of those things. All they could see was a man near death who desperately needed somebody to help him. But instead of helping him, they walked on by. In fact, they walked to the other side of the road to walk by because they were afraid maybe that if they, if they walked by too close, he might reach out and grab them trying to get some help. I often wonder if they didn't stop because they had to get to church. But that's another sermon. <laughs> but Jesus says that this Samaritan... Somebody that nobody had anything to do with. Somebody that when they knew he was a Samaritan, everybody hated. And because everybody hated him, he probably distrusted and didn't like and probably hated everybody else. It says he sees him. And then it says that he goes over to him. It says he took pity on the man and went to him and bandaged his wounds. Then it says he took the man and he put him up on his own donkey and he took him to an inn 
and he cared for him the rest of the night. And then the next day, Jesus says that the man gave the innkeeper two denarii. A denarii was a day's wage, so move that into 2024, what you make a day. He gave him two days' wages. And he told the innkeeper to go ahead and tend to the man. And when the Samaritan came back, he was going to keep going on his trip. And when he comes back, if the two denarii did not cover the cost, he would pay the extra that he needed for the guy to take care of the man who had been beaten up. So at that point, Jesus ends the parable with a question to the expert in the law. Which of these three guys was a neighbor to the robbed and beaten man? And the expert says, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus says, you're right. Go and do that. Just go do that. How do I inherit eternal life? Well, what does the law say? Well, the law says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your spirit, and love your neighbor as yourself. Okay, go do that. That's how you get eternal life. You're right. But wait a minute. Who's my neighbor? Well, in this story, who's your neighbor? Well, the neighbor's the one who took pity on the person who couldn't help themselves. Jesus says, you're right, go do that. Go do that. So what does any of this have to do with our sense of touch? Well, I think it comes down to this. The Samaritan could have called for help. He could have gone on down the road and gave the innkeeper some money and said, hey, there's a guy laying in the ditch in the road back there. And if you want to go get him, or if you want to send somebody to go get him, here's some money to take care of him. He could have called the first century version of 911. Or he could have just left him where he was. I don't want to get involved in that. I'm just going to ignore him and go on. But you see, in order to help the man, to truly help the man, the Samaritan had to physically lay his hands on him. He had to touch him. So you can't bandage wounds without touching a person. You can't put a person up on your donkey without physically picking them up. You can't help him into an inn and put him in a bed without helping him down and carrying him inside. And sometimes God calls us to help people. God calls us to help them financially. God calls us to help them prayerfully. But sometimes God calls us to help people in a way that causes us to get our hands dirty. To physically lay our hands on and touch a person or a problem. One of my favorite messages, and I have it on DVD, and we showed it here once, is a, is a, a story, um, a, a man called Norman. And you may remember that, but there's a guy who lives across the street from this crazy old man, and God keeps going, go over and invite Norman to church. And he's like, I can't do that. What are people going to think? And at some point, he begins to slowly fix up Norman's house. And he, there's a part of this thing where he talks about that he had fixed up every room in the house except one, the bathroom. And he said, God said, go fix that. And he went, God, I, I did all this other stuff. There's no way I'm going in there. God said, go in there and fix that because he needs to have it fixed. And he said he was doing things and he said he had to change out the toilet. And I remember him saying in there, he goes, there's no way to fix the toilet without hugging it. Right? <laughs> so 
Sometimes we're called to get our hands dirty when it comes to helping other people. Is it easier to just pay somebody else to do it? Probably. But think about the emotional and spiritual component of simply laying your hand on the shoulder of somebody in need. Of taking their hand and lifting them up. Or just maybe giving them a hug. You see, I spoke a while ago about Jesus healing all of those people by touching them even though he didn't need to. So why did he do it anyway? Well, I think it's because all of those people who were healed, they were considered unclean by Jewish society. No one would have ever dared touch them. But Jesus did. He said, even though I don't even have to be anywhere near you, somebody can just tell me about it, even though actually they don't even need to tell me about it because I'm, I'm God in human form. I already know about those needs. I can, I can heal you. I can heal your, I can have demons sent out of you. I can heal your lameness. I can heal your sight. I can heal your hearing. I can do all of that and I don't even have to get near you. But he goes and he, 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 he physically lays his hands on people. People who maybe for most of their life, nobody had ever touched them. Because everybody else saw them as unclean. Jesus saw them as human beings. And I believe that Jesus healed them physically. But I also believe that he, by physically touching them, he helped heal them emotionally. Because it's so important for people to feel that connection. And you may have been in this situation where somebody is really struggling through a moment in time. And you look at them and you go, what do you need? And not all the time. But you know what the answer is most of the time? I just need a hug. I just need you to put your arms around me and help me understand this is going to be okay. And even though we're really blessed and we're really blessed as a country and, and we can write checks and we can send money off to places and, and, and we can solve people's problems by, by paying their way out of those problems and doing those things. And I believe that God blesses all of that. But I truly believe that there are times when God goes, Pat, go hug the toilet. Go help them. I heard a speaker one time talk about that he was involved in a project. They, they sent shovels to Africa. Because these people were, they saw these people digging with like pieces of clay in this dirt. And, and somebody got the bright idea that we should send all these shovels to Africa. And they worked and they raised money and they sent Thousands of shovels to Africa. They were worthless. You know why? Because those people didn't have any shoes. And they physically could not put their foot on top of a shovel and drive it into the ground to dig a hole. See, long before they needed shovels, they need shoes. And sometimes we get the cart in front of the horse, right? We think, well, this is the way to fix this. And God's going, well, that's one way to fix it, but here's how I really want you to fix it. I want them to see your face. I want them to feel you shake their hand. I want them to feel you put your arms around them and hug them. Even when they're not really huggable. And I think that each of us needs to be very aware of that sometimes, that while we're getting our hands dirty 
for God, we may need to remember and understand the power of simply reaching out and touching someone. Letting them know that somebody cares about them. So we come to our senses and we think about how we touch the lives of other people. Let's pray to you. Heavenly Father, I, uh, again, I thank you for this day. I thank you for the opportunity to, to share your word. And, and, and I, I thank you for the opportunity to look at a very, very familiar passage, a very familiar story in, a, in what is a new light. Father, I, I just ask that, that you give us the understanding that sometimes we are called to get up close and personal with people and to get our hands dirty and, and to, to help them out of the situation that they're in, not for our own glory, but for yours. Father, maybe today you're laying your hand on someone in this room for the very first time. Help them to feel your presence and help them to feel your touch. Father, if that's happening today, I just ask that you also give them a boldness that they would respond to whatever you're asking them to do. Maybe it's joining his family for the very first time. Maybe it's rededicating yourself to his work. Maybe it's joining the fellowship of this church. Or, or maybe it's just gathering together with somebody to to pray you're, you're just carrying this burden that you just you just can't carry alone you need somebody to to hold your hand and, and bow their head with you and just pray whatever it is father i just ask that you would allow us to hear your voice and a boldness to answer your call father we love you and we ask these things in your son's name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. Ask everybody to stand. Uh, we'll sing our hymn of invitation. Uh, Doug's over there. Greg's this way. Uh, Adam's up front here. <coughs> Richard's over there. If anybody needs to pray and they don't feel like they want to come up here and, and in front of everybody and pray with me, there are people around this room who will pray with you and pray for you. Uh, let's hear God's call today and let's answer that call.